At Tobago Gap, in the Tunisian desert, fate would see a young man become a hero. The date, 26th of March, 1943. 50 years on, his valour is commemorated by the New Zealand Army at Linton Camp. And through his name, a scholarship has been set up to help Māori students with their education. His name? Te Moananui Akiwa Ngārimu. better soldier than him. A quiet, disciplined fellow. I'm proud of him. Very happy. Always laughing. Always very pleasant. He made the decision to go overseas and fight for his country, for his people. The Victoria Cross for me is a symbol of sacrifice. It's his name that carries it. That's how we regard him as belonging to all the Māori people, not just, not just the family, not just the Moana. The Victoria Cross is the highest honour for valour given by the British on the field of battle. The cross itself is crafted from metal taken from guns used in the Crimean War over 130 years ago. Few awards have been given to New Zealanders in the wars of this century. And in the Second World War, only five New Zealand soldiers were awarded the Victoria Cross. The sacrifices made by these men were well above and beyond the call of duty. Was it worth it? Was it worth it for those who gave their lives? This was a question asked by Sir Apitanangata in an essay called The Price of Citizenship, written in 1943. Ngata asked, did the nation appreciate the Māori effort in the war? And did the nation appreciate the sacrifice made by this man, Second Lieutenant Te Mona Nui Akiwa Māori? east coast of the North Island is Wharepunga. And here on this small hill on which I'm standing, which looks out towards the bay and is about 400 yards from the sea, is Marayake, the Ngārimu homestead. It was here on the 7th of April 1919 that Tamona Nuiake where Ngārimu was born. Initially Mo, as you are sometimes called, went to Wharepunga Native School. He was all right. He, he had a bit of temper, really, you know, sort of. Uh, but he was all right. He was a good pupil. During the mid-1920s, three generations of the Ngārimu family moved to a new homestead near Ruatoria, Pohachukura. Under the watchful eyes of Mount Hikurangi, the house was rich with people. A new home meant a new school for Moana Ngārimu. Hiruharama would see most of the 13 Ngārimu children. They had to either walk or travel by horse over the several kilometres each day. And this was adventure time. One day we came to a plum tree on the roadside and he said, you hold the, keep this horse steady and I'll climb up. I'll stand on, on the horse's back and pick plums. So he stood up, but then the horse started to eat grass, you know. And I couldn't stop the horse. I was hanging on to the 
to its neck. I wanted to laugh, but I, <laughs> I thought I'd better not. And then he cooked, yelled at her, bring that horse round here. Hurry up. And he was dangling on the, on the plum tree. At a young age, Moana was very resourceful. With a bounty on hawks, he began to get extra money by trapping them. He just put four posts under the ground like in the square. Or rectangle shape anyway. And then the rails on the top. And then on top of those he had another two rails, narrower. And he brought the netting up, right up from the bottom, up over the top to this narrow uh, slot between the two rails. And then he put the bait in there, a bit of meat or something like that. And then the hawk, when it comes down, because it closes its wings, it'll come down through that narrow gap in, in, in the netting and that. When it went to take off, it couldn't spread its wings. The young Arimu was then sent to boarding school at Toyota College in Hawke's Bay. Moana followed in the footsteps of many Māori leaders. But he was looking to the future. He didn't realise he and his schoolmates might one day be comrades in arms. On returning from boarding school, Moana Ngārimu became a shepherd on the family station. The electric fence had just come in at that time, and it was a pretty cumbersome sort of thing. I'd pick box and I think the kids now would call it a robot or whatever. It looked very much like that anyway. Anyway, they, uh, <clears throat> they connected this electric fence unit up, and... Uh, because me and my cousin we were pretty nosy, always wanting to go around there and have a look. We were fascinated by this ticking that was going on inside this this unit and all the dials and everything. So we kept going back there. Anyway, they rigged uh, some sort of uh, uh, the wire and they rigged it onto this egg. I don't know how they managed to do that, but and then they got us to go and pick it up, you see, and of course we got a shock. And, uh, well, that kept us away from that unit forever <laughs> after that. Hamuera and Mariah Ngārimu gave great encouragement to their children, supporting all their activities. At the last minute, uh, my sister dressed me up as a, a gypsy girl, and, oh, well, which I thought was very beautiful with all the little trinkets and little bags that she had and uh, then when we were all ready um, all the boys would stand out on the veranda and dad would call us out and, and uh, rehearse around the, the dining room table in the kitchen and all the time we're doing this uh, Moana would be in the background with the older sister Rakai looking on from the window to see how we were, um, how our deportment was. <laughs> you know, I was, wasn't confident, but however, with the encouragement that we'd received from outside the uh, friend of the big brother and big sister there to support us. Those are my uh, memories which I treasure a lot because at that particular evening I won the, the prize of the night. Moana also took great pride in playing sport. Rugby in the 30s was the game for communities along the east coast like Ruatoria. The black and whites of Hikurangi was Moana's team. Reaching provincial level he displayed great talent. We used to have to take the wool on our way to school and drop it off at um, this old nanny's house. She was, uh, her name was Hene Winewene. 
she was married to Renata Moike, who was one of our, our tipuna. And she used to knit the socks for him. But I remember taking the black and white wool, so they must have been hikurangi socks. <laughs> Just assuming that because uh, those were the hikurangi colours. Moana was a very, very um, humble sort of a brother, as far as you know, I can recall. He was always very quiet, and yet he had that sort of mana authority. If we did anything wrong, he'd never reprimand us with his voice, but he'd just have one look. And whenever we saw that look on his face, we knew it was time to behave otherwise. Overall, he was very, he was a very caring person. He was very firm. Uh, yes, he was the sort of person well, one word is enough. <laughs> it just, it's just the looks he gives you after that that tells you, well, <laughs> you don't carry on doing what he doesn't approve of. <laughs> During the 1930s, this house was bustling with activity and was filled with the sound of music. Mona loved music, and he used to like leading his family and friends in song. And despite the isolation of Ruatoria, he also liked to keep up with the latest trends in music from the rest of the country and from throughout the world. South of the border. There were always songs which we played on the uh, that's where I gramophone, you know, sometimes they were too tired to come and play the gramophone, he and his friends, and whoever put the favourite record at that time would get a, a sixpence reward. So, of course, everybody wanted to play different ones, uh, favourites, to get a sixpence to spend. He made a, quite a friend of the um, music uh, shopkeeper in Gisborne, uh, Mr Wyke. And Mr. Wyke uh, used to ring him up whenever he got a new lot that he thought might appeal to Moana. And then he'd make his selection and then uh, he'd have them sent down. Then, Da Walker of Tutamatai came into Moana's life. Da was exuberant. This seemed to be the start of a great romance. She was very full of fun. She was a loving person. And very open, and she got on well with the family and different people, the relations. The first time they came over, uh, they tied their horses because they didn't, mum was here and boy was here, so they thought, well, they wouldn't come while our eldest brother was here. He was very strict. So I said to them, no, he's gone out. So they came over one night and they tied their horses way down the road. Of course, Mona took his right as far as he could go. <laughs> and he got up to the road and he took his boots off. <laughs> and what he said to him, what are you doing? And he put them under the old cream stand or over the bank. And they started walking. And then that was all right. They walked up here. Mum was here. And she said, oh, come inside, boys. But however, after, Pussy says to me, I don't know how Mona got to VC. He's the biggest coward out. <laughs> Walking up from the road nearly half a mile away without any shoes on. In the 1930s, the Gaiety Theatre was the centre of social life here in Ruatoria. And as I stand here and look around this old lady, I'm surrounded by the memories of those times. And I can actually imagine Moana and his friends coming here dressed in their tuxedo and gowns to dance the night away. Mm -hmm. 